Please be turning your Bibles to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1 and go through chapter 4, verse 17. That is our text. We'll come from that section. Exodus 3, beginning verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 17. We have in this passage the record of God's calling Moses to send him into Egypt to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. And when God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he called him to, well, to put it mildly, a great task of leading and all that was involved therein, the children of Israel out of Egypt and eventually to the promised land. But now when he calls them, we find something about Moses recorded here that you won't find anywhere ever again about him. Because Moses gave all sorts of excuses as to why he didn't think that he was the man for the job. Now you know when God calls a person to do something, when God commissions him to do something, God being all wise, that is all knowing, He already knows that you're able to do it. But it's interesting to see how many times we we still try to bow out. We still try to get out of it. And Moses was no different. Now remember, Moses is 80 years old. He spent his first 40 years in what would be for that day and time the lap of luxury and power and prestige, a prince of Egypt. Great learning for that day. But now he spent 40 years down in the land of Midian in the seclusion of a shepherd. And now he's just now reached the stage at 80 to do the work God wanted him to do in the first place. Buddy, did you get that? (laughs) Now I recognize people were living longer in those days. But the point is, Sometimes we may, if we're being what God says in the New Testament we ought to be, we may spend a long time doing what's right before we really get to the place that God knew all along we were preparing ourselves to get through the work we need to do. So in a similar way, God's people many times receives a call, and I'm not saying a divine call from heaven, but a call to do what we know the Bible says the church is to be doing, and since we're members of the church, what we ought to do. And we tend to bow out ourselves. I just wanted you to know in this that uh, no greater than Moses first try to get out of it. So you're not along if, uh, alone if you get called for something. You know the work's good, and you start to try to figure out ways that you just don't really think you're able to do it. We don't usually get a call to, to a country to deliver those of physical bondage. I don't know that we have. But the call to do the work of the church, when the church is so small in a world so large, is quite a call. We are called, of course, to deliver in cooperation with God always and faithful service to Him, people from the bondage of sin. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now it's interesting to see that Peter, who first heard heard the Lord, one of those first ones to hear the Lord deliver that commission, had this to say in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 concerning those who make up the church. Who we are. Now think about that for a minute. He says, but ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood and holy people. King James says, then a peculiar people, meaning a chosen people, a purchased people, a people for God's own possession, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. But then notice what he says in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And then he tells them what they need to do. 
I think the first thing we can do and always keep before us once we become members of the church is that we're no longer a part of the way this world functions in the sense of what we choose, how we think, our viewpoint, our attitude, our concept of life, what we do in life, what's most important to us in life. If we've been educated according, according to the gospel, then of course we've been converted and all that the word convert means. We've changed. We've changed in our thinking and thus being changed in our thinking. Then we're changed in our conduct, in our dealings with our fellow man, especially in our dealings with others who have like precious faith as we do. And we recognize, too, that there's so few of us in contrast to the great world that's around us. And, of course, the whole world lies in wickedness under the power of the evil one. And we're this little group that is doing our best to follow the teachings of the Lord, willing to submit to His will. So when it comes to the excuses of Moses, we can learn some things that helps us to grow in the likeness of Christ and in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. So if you look at the first ten verses, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Now remember, they're in the patriarchal age. The Jews aren't called yet under the law of Moses. They are approaching God then under patriarchy. And here is his father-in-law being a priest of Midian. I've always wondered what all that meant for him in the way of education for that 40 years he was there. Because he was under a priest of Midian. There was that man, such as like a, a Melchizedek. They had those priests during that time. And a priest offers up sacrifices on behalf of others to God. So he's had that kind of father-in-law. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now you remember that Horeb is synonymous with Sinai and vice versa. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. I always like the inquisitors of Moses here. Now I want to ask you something. If you were out in the backside of nowhere, that's where he was, <laughs> in the backside, and you were to see a bush, and you saw it burning, and you watched it, and it just was not consumed. Would you take this attitude, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt, or would you take off the other direction to the other side of somewhere? <laughs> well, I suggest this says a lot about him. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, you see, the Lord was working on him right here. I sometimes think we fail to see that. Something happens and the man by his very character and what makes him up says, I'm going to see about this. The Lord did that to see if he would. And so the Lord uh, saw him do that. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Now you see, he never would have got the call if he hadn't gone to see the bush that wouldn't burn up. Or if you like it better, the bush that wouldn't burn down. Or the bush that just wouldn't burn. But it did burn, and it was burning, but it was not being consumed. And Moses, Moses came out of that bush, and notice the response. Here am I. And he said, draw nigh or near, hither. And then he makes sure he understands this is God. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now notice the impact that deity had on him, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore... Behold, 
The cry of the children of Israel is coming to me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Have you noticed here that God said he came down, as he talks to Moses, to deliver them? And then he ends up saying, that thou mayest bring my people forth. There's a lot said there about how God works on earth through men. Now, how is God going to bring them forth if he says, Moses, you are called by me to bring them forth? It just simply means Moses adhering to God's will will do God's bless or will do God's will in accomplishing the task. So when we do what God said do, God's will is being done. And that's important for us to know in the Lord's church. When we are carrying out the commandments of God, when we're complying with His will, when we're obedient to Him, God's work is being done. And we need to understand that it's not human work. It's not my work or your work. It's God's work. Because He's commissioned us, and especially us, the spiritual body of His Son, to carry out this work. For you see... We too are prepared by our belief and obedience to the gospel to do only the work that behooves God for us to do or that behooves us to do in God's work. But he says, notice when you begin to read this, And Moses said unto God, Who am I? That I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now if he had really listened to what God said, then by implication, the fact that God approached him and called him and told him what he wanted him to do and then said, do it, this is God, thus he knows this man is able to do. But then the humility of the man comes out, but it comes out too much. He's so humble, he's trying to get out of it. There's nothing wrong with him being humble. Notice earlier he covered his face. Because he wouldn't look upon God. He was so full of awe and reverence. And that's the kind of fear that it was. In the presence of God, we would all have that kind of response. But he says, who am I? Well, I think about that for a minute. Can you answer from the Bible, just who is this Moses? Who am I? Well, nothing but a lowly shepherd. Well, we've already seen his father-in-law as a priest of God. He spent 40 years with him. But what about the first 40 years? Don't you know there's nobody like that out there? Especially an Israelite. Because his mother had already told, uh, told him of his connection with the children of Israel, how he came to be in the house of Pharaoh. Don't you think it would sort of dawn on him that you've been prepared for this? Because do you remember when he killed the Egyptian 40 years earlier? Who was uh, persecuting one of the children of Israel? That he thought even then that the children of Israel should understand that he was the one to take care of. But now when God actually makes the direct call to him in this very miraculous way, which would confirm that this is from God and not from anybody else, uh, who am I? Who am I? Well, we could say he's an 80-year-old man. Already past the average lifespan, it's time to sit down and relax on the porch or somewhere cooler than that around Houston. Well, this prompted Moses to wonder whether he was the right man for the job, and it never hurts to do that. To really take some self inventory and say, Now, I am, am I the person to do this? But God's response, if you'll notice, was, was quick. And it should have settled the matter. Because if you look in verse 12, he says that I certainly will be with you. Now what more could a person want? If it is God's will, and I know it's for me, and I'm the one to carry it out, and God promises to be with me, where's the problem? Later, Paul wrote, as you'll remember, to the church at Rome... In Romans 8 and verse 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, Moses had plenty of people against him, but what that says is, 
is that you will be the one to get the job done that I called you to do regardless of anybody else that seeks to hinder you. But I hate to say it, uh, some of us are in the same boat today as far as using these excuses. We talked about this morning the state that we're in and what the church sees today and what we've got to do in the future. Besides the ordinary working of the church that must be done. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions, keep oneself unspotted from the world. And that's all the time regardless of the special issues that might arise or where they might come from. You know, there's not a Goliath every day waiting outside the door. But the attitude of that David when he went out to do what he did ordinarily and keeping care of the sheep was what built him up to be able to face the Goliath when the Goliath showed up outside the door. So in our routine faithful service to God, who knows what we're demonstrating to God that in the future we will be able to do that if we had not done these routine things God requires of His uh, spiritual body, the church, we wouldn't have been prepared to do these things. Uh, where are we then placing our emphasis in life? It's true that by ourselves alone we are insufficient. But God has a way when we have an attitude of submitting to His will to make us sufficient. When you pray, God help us to grow in the knowledge of the Bible, do you think you will if you don't put forth the effort to study and learn how to study and ascertain the authority of Christ? So you see, it involves my actions, but my actions demonstrate my trust that God will be with us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6, we have this statement made <clears throat> by Paul as he writes to the church at Ephesus. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Now watch what he says. But our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Of course, he's contrasting the design and purpose of the law of Moses and what it could do and was meant to do with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We who are in the church have this great blessing. And we dare not try to dodge out saying, Who am I? Well, by ourselves, we're nothing. When God sees somebody that says, Now I know this is what the church ought to do. I don't know how good I'm going to be at it. But this is what needs to be done. I'm going to step in the breach and do it. That's how people develop and grow to become stronger in the Lord. If you don't have that attitude, then you need to grow. And you need therefore to will yourself to have that attitude. It means stepping out in places that you haven't gone before because simply you know it's part of the Lord's work. When you look at the apostles of Christ, you don't have any men of high acclaim save Paul. The rest of them are basically, well, they're, as they recognize when Peter and John were preaching in Jerusalem, these are not men of letters. They have no formal education. God can take the person He calls because He knows the character of that person and make him what He needs to be. Do you remember Amos of the Old Testament? He was a herdsman and a keeper of sycamine trees. No educated person in the sense of formal education. He hadn't been to the school of the prophets. But God could take and use him because of his attitude and his willingness. And he left what he was doing because God called him. And he did it. But that he had to have the will. The old saying, where there's a will, there's a way, is so true. So God provided the assurance that Moses needs, and he provides the assurance we need. He provided the assurance the apostles need, needed when he said, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. And with his help, we can accomplish anything there is to be done that he wants done. Because we're the ones to do it. If the gospel's preached, the church has to do it. If the table is waited on to serve the Lord's Supper as one of the acts of worship, 
We've got to have it uh, some way the people get to it. Somebody has to prepare it. The details have to be done. So on and so forth. Well, that was one thing, and that was handled. But Moses then said, well, what shall I say? I think I've run across people almost use that. Well, I don't know what to say. I've noticed that in their jobs they manage to at least ask for a raise. I, I see them able to speak to their wives. It may be in defending themselves, but they're able to do it. Or vice versa. What shall I say? That's found in Exodus 3 in verse 13. He knew that they should, uh, that um, there should be people sent, that he should even go to the children of Israel. He knew that these people are going to ask questions. And when you get over there and find that he got there, you see the kind of things they said. Who is this God who sent you to us? Well, does he really think God's going to say, you're the man for the job, and now I've chosen you, but you have to hack it all along? <laughs> Perhaps we're, why we are to leave this country, we have come to consider our home for over 400 years. Why should I leave this country to speak the gospel to folks? Why should I leave this city? Why should I leave the place where I grew up? Why should I do anything that roots me out of my place of comfort? My grave with both ends open called a rut. <laughs> Why? Well, there are things that God demands of us. That's what we're here for. I, you think about it, the only worthwhile I am to myself, my family, anybody else is to make sure I serve God. The only way I know how to serve Him is to know His will and discharge my duty. So Moses expresses an inadequacy in knowing what to say. But did you notice that God is, in, in Exodus 3, is very quick to respond here too. He simply says, thus you shall say, Exodus 3, 14 and 15. I, I think of being a, a preacher, and I'm a preacher of what? The gospel, preach the word. It's already here. I don't have to wonder what to say. I have to learn how to study it. I have to learn how to write and divide the word of truth. But I simply have to know the word. And then I preach it. What did Paul say? Preach the word. Even in contending against those who would warp it, I'm told what to do. It's to contend for the same thing that I've been preaching. So whether it's one-on-one -on -one with a neighbor, or whether it's before an audience, I've got what to say. God's given it to me. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. So what am I going to say? So God tells Moses what he needs to say in response to these questions that would come to him once he goes to do the work God has called him to do. So today in the church, sometimes we try to excuse ourselves by saying that our knowledge is inadequate. Well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> the only one that can make a difference in your inadequate knowledge is you. The way I came to learn anything is to study it. By the way, Jeff, you teach a, a class in your secular work. Can you teach what you don't know? And anybody else here's teaching that's a teacher. J.D.? You don't know anything about what uh, the subject matter is, but you teach it, don't you? <laughs> well, there may be some teachers that operate that way, but I don't think J.D. does. How are you going to teach what you yourself do not know, and how are you going to know it except you yourself have done what was necessary, the way God put you together to learn it, and then learn it well enough to convey it to somebody else? But well, God's put that in our hands. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then you have to know what it takes for one to become a Christian. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And when you look at uh, what Paul tells us that he had preached in order for people to become Christians, he reminds them of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now notice what is said here. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. By which also you're saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Then he tells us specifically, For I delivered unto you 
uh, uh, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve and so forth. Notice how many times He said according to the Scriptures. You see, He had the baptismal measure of power of the Holy Spirit for two reasons. That He could receive directly from Jesus what we have in the New Testament. And then to prove it was from God and not from man by the miracle signs and wonders that he did. And we can add one more. He could lay hands as other apostles could upon members of the church so that they would have the wherewithal miraculously to carry on the Lord's work until the fully revealed New Testament was given. That's all special. But nevertheless, they had to study. They had to know. So it was when it came to Moses. So it is with us today. Suppose, Moses then says, notice he's got away from him now, suppose that they will not believe me. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. God says, you're the man, I'm God, and you know I know you. So don't ask who am I. Then, if I've called you to do this work knowing that I know you, that I, you think I'm not going to leave, that I'm going to leave you with nothing to say, and what shall I say? And he says, basically, I'll give you what to say. And now, suppose they won't believe me. That's found in chapter 4 and verse 1, by the way, of Exodus. So now he knows what to say, but he balks at the idea that the people may not listen. Well, you know, I can't help it if you don't listen. That was not his responsibility. He had to take care of the job God chose him to do. Folks, a long time ago I would quit preaching if I was sitting up here saying, I've got, I can't do my work unless you listen. Well, I want you to listen. I can show you from the Bible why you should listen. If you're a Christian, you've already learned why you should listen. But if you never listen, does that free me from being what I ought to be in my faithful service to God? And so you should take that view as a member of the church regarding the work He wants you to do. Whatever anybody else does or does not do, you have your personal responsibility before God. Ezekiel was told, you go preach just what I put in your mouth to preach. But now let me tell you something. Before you go, they're not going to hear or believe anything you say and not going to obey you. But he said, so go. He still said, go. And you go tell them only what I put in your mouth. Well, what was the idea? Well, you see, you're cooperating with God. You're giving them the wherewithal that there will be no excuses on their part, if nothing else, when the day of retribution comes. That's a part of God extending His long-suffering to people. They're without excuse. Uh, is He afraid of failing? You know, that's a possibility of being afraid to fail. You can't fail with God if you'll humbly obey. You do your part and somebody else has to do their part. I think at this stage when he said this, he'd already forgotten that God would be with him. Because if God's with us, you, you don't fail in your part. You're ready to do it. Besides that, there will be always somebody that will be out there like you that's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. God didn't tell me now every day you've got to baptize somebody. Well, I think that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? If preaching the gospel every day, somebody truly from the heart wanted to obey that form of doctrine and they were ready to be baptized. But whether they are or they aren't, I still have the responsibility to live the Christian life and all that, that means and to preach the gospel to every opportunity I have. God responds then to Moses by equipping him with several convincing proofs. In other words, he works miracles. Remember the rod? It turns into a serpent, verses 2 through 5 of 4. Then he has his own hand, which... He puts it in his bosom, comes out and it's leprous, and he puts it back in and it's all right. Exodus 4, 6 through 8. And then the water which will turn to blood when dropped on the ground, Exodus 4, 9. What's that saying? You don't have to worry about anything. I know you're the man to do the job. I've called you. You can do the job. I'll tell you what to say. And I'll show you that since I'm God and I spoke all this creation to existence, that I can alter it any way it suits me, I'll be with you. I will give you the wherewithal to accomplish my task. I think some definitely in the church hesitate to teach the gospel.
for some of the same reason. They fear failure. The fear of failure keeps them from even trying. But just as God gave Moses these great convincing proofs, so He has given us the evidences necessary to convince the honest and sincere person of the truth that we live, that we preach, and that we defend. The Word of God is able to produce faith in the person who honestly receives it. Romans 10, 17. John 20, 30 and 31. Now, if you preach it, and you know you preached it, and you live the godly life before people, and they will not respond to it, it's not your fault. It's their fault. And that's a point that I think we all need when it comes to what we do in the church. Whether elders being fully qualified doing the work God calls them to do, or deacons being what Bible says they ought to be in life and work, song leaders, Bible school teachers, you do what you personally want to do out of love of God and fulfilling your responsibility. And I guess those saying is let chips fall where they may. If each one of us had that attitude, look what would be done. You know what happens so many times? And this is a temptation for every one of us. Well, they just don't preach me, appreciate me. I try to get this done and I don't get any cooperation. And of course, you're the first one to ever have that as an excuse, aren't you? That, that's the first time it's ever dawned on the face of the earth. No, it's always going to be there. For everybody loving to do the Lord's work with the initiative to do it and to be a personal servant of Christ, those things are going to happen. The devil's not going to leave you alone. Have we forgotten that we have an adversary, the devil, who's going to work on you every way he can to get you not to do what God's called you to do? And how's he going to do it if he doesn't say, just quit, they don't, they don't appreciate it. Everything I do will get criticized. Nobody cares. They put me in charge of something and I, nothing happens right. Is that the first time the devil's ever whispered that in some member of the church's ear? Of course that's the way it's going to come. If he's going to launch out against you because you're doing what God said do, and he will, he'll give you special attention. Then he's got to get you to doubt yourself. He's got to get you to do something that says, I quit. That's what he wants. And so many brethren accommodate him. Well, then he says, it's kind of amazing, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is found in chapter 4 and verse number 10 of Exodus. He says he's not, in other words, an eloquent speaker. Have you noticed that God does not give in in all of these, all of these excuses he makes? He doesn't accommodate him at all. Here, let me sit down and you sit on my knee and, and I'll try to understand your pain. <laughs> he already knows the inability of those he calls. He knows that to begin with, Exodus 4 verse 11. But he's able to make up for anyone's shortcomings. I'm glad of that because as a human being the more you try to do what you know God says you ought to do guess what you're going to do when you set out to do things you're going to make mistakes you know who makes mistakes the people who set out to do the things they ought to do they wouldn't make a mistake like that if they never tried to do it they would just make the biggest mistake that they never attempted it he's promising again to be with Moses, Exodus 4.12. He even arranged for Aaron to be Moses' mouthpiece, Exodus 4.14-16. 4, and by the way, he ought to learn something about that because Aaron had been sent earlier to get down to where Moses is at about this time. And amazing how God pulled all that together, Exodus 4.27. That ought to have said something. See, God answered his excuse with his brother coming before he ever made the excuse. That ought to make us realize God knows everything I'm going to say before I ever say it. And he even made provision for it here. Well, we Christians, we, we try to do the same thing sometimes. And when you look at the Apostle Paul, you'll see that he, he recognized that there were problems, big problems. You can't read through Paul's writing very much without seeing 
he recognized well there were big problems. But to the church at Corinth, he said, first of all, in chapter 2 and verse 1 of the First Corinthian epistle, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. What does that mean? He wasn't a professional orator. Great flowery words. He came simply to speak what God gave him to speak. And he was fully capable of doing that. Verses 3 and 4. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You see, he had what he needed as God provided it and he used it. Sometimes we don't know we have what it takes because we won't step out to find out. This is so very important in our growth and development of the church. At the very least, we make use of those who can speak by arranging studies for them with others. And there are some of you in this congregation because you were willing to step up, say like on Wednesday night, and you found out you could do some things that you otherwise would not have found out you could do except that you stepped up to do it, no doubt because there was a sense of obligation on your part. Then he said, uh, I don't understand this really, except it's the way we all are. Please send whomever else you may send. You know, you know what this is really telling us about Moses? I don't want to go in the first place. That's exactly where the problem is. He didn't want to go. These others were just excuses. It's just a smoke screen. Designed to hide that fact and what was it? You see, he's fine. See, Moses is learning about himself here. God already knew this about him. Moses had to finally say, I'm comfortable down here. I don't want to go. Sometimes in our prayers, beloved brethren, if we would just say to God, Lord, I know this is what needs to be done. I really don't want to do it. Help me to do what I know needs to be done that I really don't want to do. Maybe we just don't know how to see ourselves as we really are because we're too busy putting up smoke screens trying to hide it from others and we've hid it from ourselves. We won't admit it. Have you ever said in your prayer to God, I just hate to do this. I'm just tired of this. I know it's what you said, but I'm tired. I'm tired. I just want to quit. That's when you need to rise up and do more. You know, they say when you're trying to reduce the time that you need to exercise is when you feel like it or you don't feel like it and, and you don't want to. Sort of like, you know, about nap time in the afternoon. That's when you need to get up and get with it. Well, spiritually speaking, there's ways that we see ourselves what we really are, but we can't hide ourselves from ourselves. And that's what Moses was doing. So as we look at all of this, we're the same today because we're humans and he was too. And in every excuse we could offer is, is really only a smoke screen. We really would rather that God use someone else and let me coast. We really don't want to do what God's called us to do. But I want you to notice this about God. God answered every one of these. Then the anger of the Lord is kindled against him. And we don't want that. Now, when you see Moses acting this way this time, you see the last time he ever acts this way. Moses learned. He learned a lot about himself that he wouldn't have known if he had enough, didn't have enough interest to go see a bush that wouldn't burn. That was the first step. Then every one of these excuses he offered, God just laid it back. He learned to implicitly trust in God. For God would not call him to do what he was not able to do as long as God supplied the wherewithal to do it. And that's how we grow in faith. How many prayers do you hear and how many do you pray? Help me to grow in faith. Help my faith to be stronger. Give me wisdom. Help me to love my brethren. Help me to love the lost as Christ loved them. Help me to be a servant like Christ. Don't you know that means you've got to go through certain things to be able to 
to put those things into practice. Rather than let's not get God angry with us. Let us humbly receive the truth and realize that as members of the church, we've already said being baptized for the remission of sins, we're here to do His good will. We're here to grow and develop. If, we, if we've been making excuses and getting out of what God needs all members to do, and by the way, when you do get out of something, that just puts something else more on somebody else that's willing to do. <laughs> then we make it harder for other people and yet, it's, this is a common thing. This is something every one of us face, no matter who we are. And we need to realize that we, that we have to face it as Moses faced it and then do something about it. So with Moses, we know the rest of the story. He answered the call. He went to Egypt. And with the great help of God, he delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And what about us? What, what's the rest of the story with the rest of your life? Shall we heed the call to preach the gospel, to teach the truth, to be active in all God wants the church to do? To step forward and be counted, and when we're not sure, but we want to do it, we step forward and we become better at it because we try and we try again, and when we stumble and fall, we get back up and hit it again? It's up to us. Only time's going to tell, but that's going to run out someday. So I pray that I encourage all to make excuses to make excuses. What does that mean? It means I'm not going to make any more excuses when I know God wants me to do things. So make excuses to Satan is what I'm saying. Tell him you haven't got time to listen to him. That you're more interested in the Lord's work. And even though you're just one person, you are one and you can't do everything, but you can do something and by the grace of God you will do what one person can do. As Moses did. And then things will change more than we ever know. If you're not a child of God, now's the time to make the first step and become one this afternoon by believing in Christ with all your heart, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Then in the church to which He will add you to serve Him faithfully as we've studied this evening, recognizing how Satan tries to get you to stop. And now, buddy, I've hit it again. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. If you're subject to the call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.